the podium. Let me assure you, I am not important, and I certainly don't know everything. Yeah, I wish I did. Um, big thank you today for inviting me to come and speak to you. It's really uh, it's a great pleasure to be here in Warsaw today. A special thank you to Christoph for having made it possible, and um, we have several members of the NSA Management Board who you will probably see throughout the day and who will join us in the discussion. So I want to talk to you about the NIS Directive. Who has heard of the NIS Directive? Oh, well, that's pretty good. Okay, that's a good start. Um, what I want to do is make it interactive. So if I say something that alarms you or you don't agree with, please feel free to, to raise a question. I think the value of these things is much more in the discussion and the debate than in me just talking to you about what I think. And of course, we'll have a panel discussion afterwards where we'll hear what the different member states think. So how do I want to do this? Well, I want to talk uh, a little bit about Anissa just to kick us off. Then I'll go over what the key points of the directive are to make sure we're all on the same page. And then I'll talk about the objectives in more detail. And I'm going to split it into capacity building, um, network level cooperation, and uh, securing the two types of operator we're talking about, which are essential operators and um, DSPs, digital service providers. And then we'll have a quick look at the final provisions. But before I do that, let me just say a few words about Anissa. Um, ANISA is the European Network and Information Security Agency. Uh, we are um, a regulatory agency, which means we have a high degree of autonomy. Although, of course, the way we work is hand in hand with the member states uh, and the commission. So we have a very collaborative model, which is what this slide is showing you um, here. And the fact that we put mobilizing communities at the center of this says a lot. Everything ANISA does, it does through people like yourselves. Yeah? The goal of my team really is to get the maximum out of you, to leverage all the experience in the member states, the experience, what went wrong, what went right, and to make sure that it flows across Europe and we don't make the same mistakes twice and that we get the best advantage out of what we now call best practices, etc. Yeah? So this is very important. We do three types of work. We do recommendations, which are papers, but you all know papers are a long way from impact, right? People have to read them, they have to understand them, they have to want to implement them, and then they have to implement them well. So we're trying to really go round anti-clockwise in this clock here. Uh, the second activity is policy implementation, where we really work very closely with member states to actually do the job, to make sure that stuff gets implemented in a reasonable and economically viable way. So it doesn't cost too much money, and we get good security out of it. And last but not least, we do hands-on work. The uh, example you may know is that we coordinate the pan-European exercise which is, we believe, the, the biggest security exercise in the world. Very exciting stuff, uh, really interesting to be there and watch it. And this took place uh, a couple of weeks ago in, in Athens, and the game was very successful. Again, I stress that the success of ANISA, where we have it, is really due to yourselves. Yeah? I mean, we, of course, work very hard, but all the experience comes from the member states. That's a very important thing. Just a quick view on who we work with. We work with many, many different communities. Um, we work uh, with Europol, we work with, uh, we're starting to work uh, a little bit with the European Defense Agency, supporting them in exercises. We work with all kinds of information sharing communities. Uh, we work with different sectors. We do an awful, awfully large amount of work with the, with the C-certs, and I'll be mentioning that later as one of our, our biggest blocks of activity. So again, it's always the same thing, that community work produces the best results if it's done correctly. Okay, enough about ANISA. Let's have a look at the NIS Directive. What is it all about? Essentially, what the NIS Directive is all about is securing essential stuff. The stuff that you need in order for society to go on correctly. Yeah? And we'll see a bit later that we split the kinds of people we talk about into two groups. One which are called, not surprisingly, essential operators, and another which are called digital service providers, which are still, we believe, highly important because the services they provide are still fundamentally underpinning our society. Yeah? So the thing you should have in your head when thinking about the NIS Directive is that we're really trying here to secure the most important functions for society. Now, let me tell you something. If you look back at um, EU policy history in this area, it's quite interesting because we always talk about infrastructure. But bear in mind that if you secure the infrastructure, you have not secured the services, right? the stuff that runs on top of this infrastructure. So it's by no means game over. And in fact, I come from the banking sector. I spent many years um, in, in banking sector security. And we actually took as an assumption that the infrastructure was insecure. 
and we built all the security into the applications that run on top of it. So this is important, it's extremely important, but there's still work left to do, and that's securing the stuff that runs on top of the infrastructure. So the NIS directive, um, the scope is to achieve a high common level of security of NIS within the union. Could mean anything, right? And in fact, that's the state at the moment. We have to define what that means. And I think it will be the largely implementa the implementation measures which define exactly what we mean by a higher common level of security. So we're not starting out with a blueprint. We are starting out with a sort of objective, if you like. And again, it's important to realize that this is undefined. We will define it as we go along. Uh, it's adopted August 2016, and the deadline for transposition, transposition is, is if you like, converting it into member state law, is 9th of May 2018, so 21 months. 21 months is not a long time. It's a huge challenge. It's a very ambitious piece of legislation, um, and we're going to hear a little bit more about this when we talk to the member states in the panel discussion. So the provisions, what we're looking at really is improved cybersecurity capabilities at the national level, Increased EU level cooperation. So if you put the two together, ideally, you know, you should have a very strong system. That's of course is assuming that what the national competences are doing is aligned with each other. And I'll come back to that because it's one of the biggest challenges of the NIS directive. It sets obligations for these operative essential services and it sets obligations for the digital service providers. So it looks a bit like this. Um, the red stuff on the right-hand side is the really critical stuff. If this goes down, we're going to have some major problems. So it's things like energy, drinking water. It's things like transport, banking, and financial services. You know, something like Reuters goes down or Swift, uh, one of these institutions. We will have a worldwide impact. It will affect the markets very quickly. So this is also critical. Uh, digital infrastructure. These are the things that society needs in order to run correctly. Now. On the left-hand side, we have a different group uh, of operators, as we call them, or actors, if you like. These are the people who are running stuff which doesn't seem from a first glance to be so important, but when you think about it, it is. Cloud services, for instance, when we had the Fukushima incident, information flowed largely due to cloud. It wasn't meant to be that way, but it was just about the only service that was running. So cloud is becoming critical. Um, <clears throat> search engines. If you cannot access search engines, you know, a lot of things will not run correctly. So they're not critical in the same way as energy and drinking water, but they are still extremely important if we are going to uh, carry on with our normal day-to-day -day lives. This is the structure of the NIS Directive. I give it because I'm going to leave you with the slides afterwards. I think it's good to know what the structure is. I know reading legislation is very boring, but sometimes it really helps to go back and see exactly what is meant and uh, what, the, what the correct wording is. So the red stuff, of course, is, is where the meat of the directive is, and the other is really sort of the administrative, administrative wrapping around it. Do take a look at it. Um, I say, I, I know it's very hard to read legislation. I find it hard myself, but it, it's really worth it in this case. Remember, it's the first piece of cybersecurity legislation we've done in Europe, at the European level. Huh? So the timeline, <clears throat> as I said, very ambitious, but okay. Um, we believe it can be done. Uh, it's an enormous amount of effort, and it really doesn't make uh, any sense setting goals too far into the future because things change too fast. So we need to move this fast. So it enters into force in, well, it has entered into force. A cooperation group starts its tasks in February 2017. And again, you, you'll understand this slide better when I've been through what these various um, parts of the directive are. But essentially, by after 57 months, we should have a commission review, and we should be able to say that this thing has been implemented. Come back to the slide after I've been through the rest, and you'll understand it better. So here's the meat of it. This is what it's all about. Let's start with capacity building. Capacity building is huge in international cybersecurity. It's the thing that gets mentioned most. It's a realization of the fact that we actually have, uh, at least in Europe, uh, we have a very good policy framework. We have lots of great ideas, but we need implementation measures that can move with the times fast enough. Yeah? So capacity building is essential, and it covers a whole range of things, ranging from building up people's skill sets, from keeping training going, to building the right systems, to having the right methodologies. It's a very wide-ranging term, enormously important. So what does the directive say here? Well, it says that the EU member states need to adopt a national NIS strategy. So they need to say 
what is important and what they're going to do. Now, the good news is that Anissa has been working with you for many years on this already, and there are, I can't remember exactly how many national strategies there are, but it's over 20, that's for sure. So most countries have already got something in place. Now, these strategies have to define, obviously, the strategic objectives, the priorities and the governance framework. So, you know, how are you going to manage all this? Who is going to do what? Measures on preparedness, response, and recovery two different facets. One is getting yourself ready for the event, the other is taking over once it's happened. INISA, for instance, has absolutely no um, responsibilities or mandate in the response phase. So if something were to happen in Europe tomorrow, uh, we can do nothing in terms of response. Not by a mandate, I'm sure we would do our best to support uh, what's going on, but that's not our role. We are entirely in the preparatory phase. Yeah? Cooperation methods between public and private sectors, this is a huge part of INISA's work. Um, if you think about what we call critical infrastructure, it's a public sector concern, but most of it is run and managed by private sector entities. So having strong public-private cooperation is extremely important. It's also very difficult, incidentally. It's one of the biggest problems that Europe is facing, because at the European level, if you think about it, if you want to have a public-private partnership, the smallest you can have is 56. Right? One public and one private from every member state. But we know that trust is built up in small groups, and 56 is a lot of people. So there's already a contradiction there. And we see this. You know, we see this when dealing with PPPs at the European level. It's very hard to build trust because it's such a huge group of people and quite often faces change, etc. So this is a problem that we are somewhat struggling with, um, getting better as we go along, and extremely important. Hence, part of the directive. And then awareness, raising, training, and education, of course. I will make a remark here as well. Um, if you look at training across Europe, most of security training, the professional security training, seems to be uh, aimed at very particular posts, such as the CISO or a network engineer. There's only one CISO in every organization. That's not a lot of people, yeah? And the other disadvantage of, of being so focused is that I see certain people from industry believing you know, that you can recruit someone with CIO tra CISO training at 25 years old and make them a CISO. That, in my opinion, is absolutely not the case. A CISO, Chief Information Security Officer, needs awareness, needs experience. They are generally you know, older people who've been through the ranks and, and seen how things work. It's a bit like recruiting a 17-year-old general, if you like. Yeah? You don't do that. You need experience to be a general. So. Important, national strategies. They need to designate one or more national competent authorities. So you need to know in, in every member state who is dealing with this. And member states will need to designate one or more computer security incident response teams, also known as CERTs, computer emergency response teams. Extremely important people. These are the front line and have been for the last 20 years, ever since the Morris Worm, which was probably the first internet incident that, uh, that happened. These are the only people, really, who are you know, totally uh, dedicated to frontline support. So they're an important part of the directive. And their tasks are monitoring incidents, providing early warning, and incident response. So what's in this role in this? As I said, we've been doing it for quite some time. We've been working very closely with the member states. What we do is we try to spread good practice. Um, we provided an evaluation guide to help member states see whether they are uh, living up to what we consider the European norm, and we uh, maintain an interactive map of the, the implementation. So the big comment I would make about NIS strategies is that we are now at a stage where, as I say, a lot of countries have good strategies, and now the challenge is to make sure they are updated properly. So there's a life cycle behind it, and that we don't just sit back and think the job is done for the next 10 years. That is never true in information technology, of course. It's a fast-moving business, and we need to make sure that these things are evolving as things evolve. Give you one example of this, not subject today, but people still talk about the Internet of Things as if it's tomorrow's technology. Please don't think that. <laughs> it is here now. It is in people's houses now, yeah? and we need to secure it now. It is absolutely not tomorrow's technology. There are other things coming down the line. So it's really important that we remain ahead of the curve. And to be brutally frank, we do not. We are far too slow in a lot of things. But then again, so is a lot of the rest of the world. Yeah? So we try to get better. So increased EU level cooperation. This is what I would say is really the heart of the directive. And it's all about getting people to talk to each other in a sensible way. 
Now let's think about that. Getting people to talk together in a sensible way. It sounds obvious, doesn't it? But it doesn't happen as often as I would like, yeah? From my perspective in Anissa. Let me give you an example of this. How many of you have been to conferences where people say, we must share more information? Probably all of you. I really disagree with this. We absolutely do not need to share more information. We probably need to share less information, but it needs to be the right information to get the job done. And that's where the difficulty becomes, of course. It's very easy to make a high-level abstract statement, we should share more information. But we live in an age of data pollution. We don't know what to do with it. So the real challenge, I think, is, is taking this information, analyzing it, and making sure that when you share it with something else, someone else, something is going to come of it. And that is also, I think, a major task of the NIS Directive, that we go end to end. That when we share information, we're not just happy with having shared the information. We see what happens to it. We see it produces a goal, and then we share the results of having implemented that with the other member states across the union. So cooperation, very important. Um, the NIS Directive defines what is called the EU Cooperation Network, which is split into two parts. One is called a cooperation group, which is a high-level political group. Many members here, uh, I know at least some of you are part of this group. Um, it also creates a network of national C-certs, which are more the operational level. So, you know, if you take a big picture view, you have the political level which is there to make decisions, make policies, etc., and you have the CSETs there who are there to say, hey guys, don't make that decision because what our data is telling us is you should go the other way. So there should be a constant feedback between these groups where we learn stuff at the operational level, make the right decisions at the policy level, and that's fed back to the operational level. Uh, and again, this is, we, we, we were, many of us were in the cooperation group yesterday, and it's a huge challenge to set this, this cycle in motion. But if we don't, we will miss an important part of, uh, point of synergy. So cooperation group provides strategic guidance for the CSERTs. It assists the member states in capacity building, supports the member states in the identification of uh, what are called essential operators, and evaluates national strategies, whereas the CSERT network exchanges information, provides support, and identifies forms of coordinated incident response. So a lot more low level, if you like. Yeah? What is our role? Well, in the cooperation group, um, we are really there um, to help stimulate the discussion, to provide the results of, of what we do, absolutely not to make decisions. This is a group of member states. They have the decision-making power. We are there to support them. So we inject good ideas. We, uh, we tell them what's going on as, as a result of the different studies we're doing. So providing strategic guidance for the activities of the CSET network, et cetera, this is what the group itself does. We just help them do this, if you like. In the CSERT networks, it's a lot different. Um, in the CSERT network, INISA is uh, the secretariat, and I believe the directive describes us as a proactive secretariat. So here we are working together with several member states, and there's some very proactive member states who are really pushing the agenda here to make sure that this group really produces something. Yeah? And again, it's a bit the same sort of idea, but I think here we are much closer to the action in the sense that what we do is um, much more at this level. So perhaps I didn't explain this, but if you compare ANISA with the Commission, for instance, the Commission is a strategic legislative producing body, very high level, um, very long-term vision. ANISA is much more hands-on. Uh, it's much more oriented towards day-to-day -to -day work, learning from communities, etc. So it's very well aligned with this group. So what we want to do is encourage strong cooperation with the uh, cooperation group, um, a good exchange of uh, information on best practice and incidents, identifying coordinated response, etc. You can, you can read the slide, yeah. You get, you get the picture, I think. I think the thing to remember is that ANISA is more, not active, but more perhaps influential in this group, which is close to what we do, whereas we, um, we are helping to make the glue between the two groups in the, in the cooperation group, which is more policy-oriented. States of current work, well, um, we have a proposal for terms of reference and action plan on the table. Um, Holland did a lot of work here to help uh, start the discussion going. We've been working very closely with them. Other member states have joined into this. So it's quite advanced. Uh, we've had regular contacts uh, with Holland, Slovakia, and uh, Malta. Um, meetings so far, two informal meetings during the Netherlands presidency, um, one in The Hague, a uh, second one in Riga. And there's one coming up on the 9th during the Slovakian presidency. 
and the first formal meeting will be in February. So this is all you know, warming up, talking to each other, greasing the wheels, as it were, but we don't officially start until February. And we're doing a lot of preparatory work uh, in the background. Now, let's look at the two core key components now. So what we've seen is a big emphasis on capacity building, big emphasis on cooperation. Now let's look at who we're trying to help. So essential services, as I said, are really the core. OES is uh, Operators of Essential Services. That's the acronym that's used in the directive. Yeah? So these are the people, the institutions, you know, the bodies, that if these fail, we have a real problem. We need to define minimum security measures. So what is absolutely necessary in order that these things keep alive? Yeah? And this is actually very tricky, much more tricky than you may think, because if you work in a bank, as I did for many years, Probably, you know, out of the confidentiality, integrity, availability trio, integrity is the one that you care most about. Because if you get it wrong, you lose a lot of money. Availability, you can quite often write off with a contractual clause. You can't do that with integrity, okay? If you're a private bank, it's confidentiality. If you're in the, the industrial control systems business, you care about availability. If your electricity grid is not working, you have a major problem. Now, that may sound obvious when I put it like that, but when you get groups of people together, and they start discussing. These kind of things don't come out as quickly as you may expect, and people have biases on, on certain ways of doing things, and there are good reasons for it. Yeah? But it takes time for them to come out. So defining a minimum uh, security requirements is going to be tough. And the way we will go about it is we will start by defining common requirements, which we think everybody needs to follow. Example would be secure coding, good configuration of systems. Everybody has to do this. And then we will also try and give a first cut analysis of where the differences are likely to be, such as the integrity availability argument I just gave you, and then uh, the member states themselves will dig further into at the sectorial level. And of course, it's a very big task. Incident notification, well, you all know this. Uh, two types of breach notification, globally speaking, across the world. One is security breach notification, which is reporting to an authority. Um, come back to that later. Um, when you are breached, yeah. Another is data breach notification. This is a different idea which dates from an old Californian state bill, uh, I think about 20 years ago now. And the idea is that when you are breached, if you are holding other people's data, you have to report it so that they know that their data is breached. Now, they're two different concepts, two different legal backgrounds, but industry does not want to know about that, right? If you're an industry, you want one process, you don't want two. So the challenge is to bring them together despite their differences and get something which is economically feasible, lightweight as possible, and still delivering the goods. That's the challenge. Identification of operators of essential services. So we need to dig deeper into who these people are, what the criteria are for identifying them. We have a good idea, of course, but it's not perfect. So it needs to be refined so that we know exactly what the criteria are, and hopefully we get common criteria across the whole of the EU. That's a challenge because, again, the prerogative lies with the member states, so we have to try and make sure that they're aligned as far as possible. And making sure that authorities have the powers and means to assess security and check evidence of compliance. This is really uh, the heart of the directive now. Now, what is our role? Um, we will help uh, Commission of Member States in the identification of OES, um, so to, to do this refinement, if you like. Um, preliminary work started in 2016. And we uh, hope to finish this in 2017. Uh, future work in 2017 also includes incident reporting guidelines, minimum security measures, and identification. So we're working in all three areas, but we are working at the common EU level. Digital service providers, these are the other side of the coin. These are the people who are at first sight are not so critical, but when you think about it are, such as the search engines, the cloud uh, providers, etc. Here, I think the message I want to pass is that we want to go for a light touch, of course. Yeah? We do not want to put very heavy requirements on fast-moving, agile industries that need to remain fast-moving in order to develop their business cases. That's not helping anyone. Yeah? And I think everyone, certainly the member states, but also in this and the Commission, are very conscious of the fact that cybersecurity needs to be a lever. It needs to be an advantage, an incentive, and not a barrier. So it's very important we get this right. Now made the point yesterday in this famous cooperation group which I told you about. The difficulty here is we have other pieces of legislation going on in parallel. I'm sure you've all heard of the general data protection uh, regulation. And here there are also um, 
requirements on everybody, and they unfortunately do not have this lightweight touch. So we need to be careful that we don't give you know, a lighter way of doing things to the DSPs in the NIS directive, only to find out they have to do it anyway for the GDPR. These are the kind of things we are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, yeah? And there we will find some kind of compromise. Um, so they also have to um, re respect minimum security measures and incident notification. Um, note here that the NIS directive is applicable only to large and medium enterprises. We are not targeting, you know, the butcher at the corner of the street or the small shop or whatever. Again, this doesn't make a lot of sense. We are targeting people like Facebook in their role as a cloud provider, yeah? Uh, we are targeting people like Amazon as a cloud provider, et cetera, et cetera. So what's our role here? Well, we're supporting with um, production of what is known as uh, secondary legislation for DSP. So this is a bit more prescriptive than what's going on with the operators, that what's going on with operators is the privilege of the member states. So we're helping the commission come up with guidelines for implementing incident notification and guidelines for implementing security measures. Now, just, I'm going to wrap up shortly, yeah, but just to say we've done all this before with what is known as Article 13A of the Telecoms uh, Framework uh, Directive, which was 2009. This is obligatory security breach notification. And it's a funny story because when we first said we were going to do this, everyone threw their hands in the air and said, oh, it's impossible, the sky will fall down, we're all going to die, it's far too expensive, etc. None of this, of course, happened. Um, we actually found a very, very lightweight system which is very effective, and we learned some interesting stuff. So don't think that security broach notification is useless and you're just doing it to go through the ropes. Uh, when I give in conferences the results of the data of this security breach notification to experts, if they haven't seen the data, they nearly always get it wrong. Nearly always. That's interesting. And let me tell you straight away, for instance, that the number one threat uh, facing our network infrastructure in Europe is absolutely not malicious code or a cyber attack or anything like that. This is around about 6% of the incidents. It is quite simply badly written code and badly configured code. That's a useful thing to know because if you're going to invest, invest where the problem is, right? I'm not saying don't take care of the cyber incidents. Of course I'm not. But I'm saying let's re recognize there's a problem there which is far bigger at the moment. Okay, um, there are some final provisions in the directive. They're here, so member states define the rules on penalties. So they set the penalties for their communities. Uh, commission will be supported by Network and Information Security Committee. Commission will submit a report to the Parliament and the Council one year after the date of transposition. So there will be some feedback on this. And as I said, the transposition period is 21 months. Okay, so I think hopefully you understand what the directive is. You see who the players are. Hopefully I've given you a, a taste of just how challenging this is. And believe me, you know, all this stuff sounds evident, but when we, when we try to do it, it's very, very difficult. So let me finish with there. And again, let me thank you uh, for listening, and let me thank you also for your participation in the things that led up to this. Thank you, Steve, for, for the presentation. If uh, there is uh, any immediate questions, please. Hi, good morning. Welcome to Warsaw. My name is Joanna Karczewska, and uh, I would like to hear something more about uh, NIS directive versus GDPR. Because I, I have the distinct impression that uh, Somehow, you, th these two documents were developed by different group, groups, and they met at the last moment. And you introduced something into the NIST directive, a reference to GDPR. GDPR does not reference NIST, direct, the NIST directive, but uh, um, the industry is now concentrating on GDPR. Everybody is running around and saying, you know, you can get fined. 10 million euros makes it very serious. So how do you intend to make these two documents meet at one point or another? Well, that's a very good point, and I'm going to surprise you because I'm going to agree with you. It was like that. Um, it was separate areas of the Commission leading these things. It happens. Yeah, It's a big machine, a lot of work going on. Um, 
So if, if you look at things from a historical perspective, the great thing about the, um, the EU cybersecurity strategy, for those who know it, was already that brought three separate areas of policy together, which had never been together before. Yeah? This was defense, cybercrime, and the, uh, what we call the old pillar one, which is the open market side of security. Um, so the three commissioners got together. The data protection uh, law developed in parallel. I think we all recognize that. And indeed, you know, we put them together rather late. Um, and we, we are working on that on a daily basis. So I can't say we're going to do this, this, and this. But certainly, first thing is the problem is recognized, that there's some work to do in order to make them perfectly compliant one with the other. They are not, of course, um, what's the word, incompatible with each other. It's just that we have to sort out, you know, what the relative priorities are. And I think, uh, I also agree with you, if you look at the way industry is going, that there's a lot of attention on the GDPR because the penalties are so high. And I think the, 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 the problem with the GDPR is, is if we get it wrong, we will move into a highly litigated society where the smallest incident will go through the courts. So what Anissa has launched some time ago as a suggestion is for the GDPR, why don't we come up with a practical framework based on practical tools and methods, which everyone can understand and which is not couched in this legal language, and say that if you obey this framework, you have some degree of protection from prosecution. That would be a nice practical way forward. And this is what we're pushing. What Anissa would like to do in this equation, incidentally, is, is exactly that. We believe that the state of the art with the GDPR is that we have now a very strong uh, legal framework, probably the strongest in the world, very well developed, but the tools and processes we are using are miles away from this. Yeah, as a practitioner, I can tell you there's not much there. You can't come in every morning and see a big green circle on your computer saying all my data is private and then you plug it into the internet and it goes half red and you know it's not private anymore you have nothing like this you don't have these tools so we recognize the problem we are starting to put forward solutions and we are talking to each other a lot uh, yesterday in the cooperation group as I said this discussion came up so I think what you will see is over a period of time you will see these two things coming together um, exactly how and what form I wish I could tell you I can't but our idea would be, let's now concentrate on pragmatic things. Let's concentrate on real tools and real methodologies that get rid of this litigation society. And let's make sure everything we do to secure GDPR is similar to what we're doing for NIS and is not in contradiction with each other. Okay. So uh, thank you for this presentation.